Good evening and welcome to the fifth day of the virtual Camino in Croatia. We are continuing our interactive journey at the island of Kirk, heading on towards new destinations, discovering new places to enjoy. And of course, enjoying Camino stories that we share along the way. Our journey begins as every day with a prayer to Apostle Santiago. O oh God, who brought your servant Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, protecting him in his wanderings, who guided the Hebrew people across the desert, we ask that you watch over us, your servants, as we walk, at least virtually, in the love of your name to Santiago de Compostela. Be for us our companion on the walk, our guide on the crossroads, our breath in our weariness, our protection in danger, our albergue on the Camino, our shade in the heat, our light in the darkness, our consolation in our discouragements, and our strength in our intentions, so that with your guidance, we may arrive safe and sound at the end of the road and enriched with grace and virtue, we return safely to our homes filled with joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Apostle Santiago, pray for us. Santa Maria, pray for us. Our journey continues in the city of Vermnik, where we enjoyed a virtual glass of the superb white wine, Zlachtina from Vermnik, or noble wine, as it is known in local dialect. Today, we have more pilgrims on the road than before. These photos are from October 2019, where we started the official marking of the route and where we invited pilgrims to join us for a Camino week. Since this was Saturday, we were joined by close to 100 pilgrims all over Croatia, Slovenia, and other places who decided to do the Camino uh, at the island of Kirk. What drew them here besides, of course, the irresistible lure of the Camino? Well, Kirk is quite close to uh, and only a few, drivers, few hours away by car from Germany, Austria, Northern Italy, Switzerland. It has a, its own airport, so it's easily accessible. You don't have to set aside a month or more as you need to do if you're doing some of the routes in Spain. You can do it in a couple of days or over a weekend and enjoy the Camino experience. The route continues slightly uphill following the yellow arrows that we're leaving behind for future pilgrims. And the nature is bountiful. Uh, some mushrooms can be found along the way and quite sizable ones you can see. There is a, another bit of diverse scenery relieving those forests that we followed along the way to some more typical Mediterranean type of scenery. Then a little bit down, a little bit up, you can see this part of scenery is more typical to the Dalmatian and generally Croatian coast. Rocks abound, very difficult to find patch of arable land, unlike the other locations that we walked these couple of days. Of course, walking the Camino means carrying a heavy backpack. At least it's heavy enough, even the lightest one possible. I remember when I did my first Camino, I thought I was prepared. I thought I'd carried only the bare necessities. However, after crossing the Pyrenees, I did discover I did not need about a kilo of the equipment. It's amazing how that Donativo table at Roncesvalles, which is the next stop after the Pyrenees, is filled with various items of equipment that the pilgrims leave behind, finding it too hard to carry. But I think it's also 
a reflection on, on our material values and world where we always need to carry that extra item in what if this happens or what if that happens. Letting go and trusting in the Camino providence to guide the way can be a challenge. There is some talk about not carrying more than 10% of your body weight. I would suggest not carrying an extra gram if it's not absolutely necessary. Initially, when I heard about stories about pilgrims who are drilling holes in their toothbrush handles, I thought it was a little bit extreme. After crossing the Pyrenees, I can totally understand their point of view. The burdens, sometimes we have to carry another pilgrim, fortunately, not too long. But the Camino burdens and burdens of life in general that we carry on the Camino, it's easier to set aside and leave things out of our backpack than it is to set aside and leave things in our minds, in our souls, in our hearts. I'm reminded of the quote by St. Teresa from Avila, the co-patron of Spain together with Apostle Santiago, let nothing worry you, let nothing cause you anxiety. Everything passes, only God remains the same. He who is patient achieves everything and who has God has everything. Only God is sufficient. Or Italian popular saint, Saint Padre Pio, don't worry about things that cause anxiety or fear. It is only necessary to do one thing, to uplift your spirit and to love God. So as we uplift our spirit, we uplift our bodies as well to the plateau on top of this rise that we saw just now. This section, of course, first we deserve a well-earned break, but this section is basically a pretty straight road following the ridge, more or less straight road, following the ridge on our way to Bashka. Some magnificent scenery, and in this section, we still have some greenery and shrubbery, but as we continue along, it's becoming more rock-filled garden until we reach a spectacular side of nature a bit further on. At this part, it's almost impossible to get lost, though still there are arrows pointing the way. And the next stamp we got along the way. But it also reminds me of the spiritual aspect of the Camino. Uh, in my experience, most pilgrims who walk the Camino aren't overly religious. They're going to pilgrim masses and receiving pilgrim blessing because it's a sort of a Camino custom, at least for a sizable chunk of them. However, even those who are agnostic or atheists have a very deep spiritual experience on the Camino. It's, it is said everybody walks their own Camino, but the Camino is also an experience which allows you to get in touch with your inner self or a higher power. I was reminded of that as I started a Camino from Lourdes following one of the Camino uh, networks in uh, France, which was truly a remarkable experience after spending the night on a candlelight procession, praying the rosary around the sanctuary at Lourdes. The next morning, I started my Camino towards Santiago de Compostela. And the first obstacle I came across was a locked fence surrounding the sanctuary because I started, of course, very early around 6 a.m. So the fence was closed. After dropping the backpack across the fence, I somehow managed to climb across without breaking my legs and ruining the beginning of my Camino. This was also one of the more remarkable masses that I've encountered along the way. The first town after Lourdes, a small French village, there were only three people 
at the mass, a guy from Switzerland, a guy from Australia, and myself. Only the guy from Switzerland spoke French, although the priest tried very hard um, using gestures and mimics and trying to describe what he was talking about. Unfortunately, it proved too much for our very limited French. But we also joined in the rendition of the famous pilgrim song, Ultrea, in this church. And the acoustics and the atmosphere were truly marvelous. This is a small church at Saint Jean Pied de Port, a place where Mass, the first time I heard Mass in Basque language, one of the oldest European languages. It has a completely different melody, rhythm, than vast majority of European languages which are based on German or Latin. And it was a truly remarkable experience. A small chapel just before Pamplona has a crucifix. The uh, green and yellow post-it notes you see surrounding the crucifix represent hundreds of prayers, intentions, uh, encouragements for pilgrims along the way. And this, of course, is Granon. The reason I'm mentioning Granon in various contexts throughout this virtual Camino is because I found it one of the most impressive experiences on the Camino. This is the beginning, or just a few minutes, before the beginning of a candle ceremony. The lights go out. The only light remaining is from those small candles you see next to the benches. And a candle starts going from one pilgrim to another in complete silence. Each pilgrim, if they choose so, in a language they choose, can share what they're feeling at the moment, can share their experiences, the reason why they're doing the Camino, what have they discovered on the Camino, what are they grateful for. And it's a specially moving experience. After the ceremony, there is a so-called Granon stamp. Granon is the only albergue on the Camino which doesn't give you an actual stamp like other places do. Instead, the Granon stamp is a hug where two hearts touch. So complete strangers, or at least that's what they were before the candle ceremony, hug each other as a way to exchange the Granon stamp. This is uh, a small town just after Burgos, about 20 kilometers, Guadilla del Camino, if I recall correctly, and Father Manuel. Father Manuel is a great believer in the words of St. Augustine, he who sings prays twice. So before the pilgrim blessing, he basically invites every pilgrim to join him in a song. And he won't accept excuses like, well, I don't know how to carry a tune. He'll help you. Even in, he, can, he even knows how to sing in Chinese, which was remarkable. Another great believers in the words of St. Augustine's are sisters in uh, Albergue Santa Maria at Carrion de los Condes. Every day they hold a special pilgrim meeting with a motto, Canta y Camina, walk and sing. The pilgrims at a meeting are invited to introduce themselves. What's their name? Where are they from? And if they wish to share, why are they on the Camino? Uh, usually it's followed by a song from a pilgrim's country. The sisters are remarkable. The, I witnessed a scene with a Japanese pilgrim and they sang him a song in Japanese. Uh, at the end of the song, he said, wow, your Japanese is better than mine. A remarkable experience, which is continued at the ceremony after the pilgrim mass, where the sisters and the priest uh, give out a pilgrim blessing. You'll see that uh, the volunteer to the right of the sister uh, behind the candle is giving out something to the pilgrims after blessing. That is a special Granon paper star. 
It's a small gift symbolizing the light of Christ that pilgrims accept with, uh, speaking from personal experience, with awe and gratitude. Let's glimpse a little bit of the atmosphere at Carillon. Being on top of the hill reminds us of some spiritual aspects. Even in the Gospels, some key moments happen uphill. Both literally and metaphorically, the perspective is much clearer. The Sermon on the Mount happens uphill. The Transfiguration on the hill Tabor also happens uphill. So it's a really encouraging experience if you want to get touch with some deeper questions about who you are and what are you doing here. Another highly fascinating Camino custom is called Camino Angels. Now let's see, what is that about? This was a place where I spent uh, half an hour on my first Camino. After exiting the forest a couple of days before Santiago, I was feeling beat. I felt like I couldn't take another step. So I saw this Donastivo stand typical in Galicia with a couple of pilgrims sitting in that bench to the left with the lady of the house. As I greeted them and sat down, she immediately said, take off your shoes, take off your socks. You obviously need a foot massage. Boy, did I ever. It was a remarkable massage with some fabulous cream which kept my feet fresh and reinvigorated for the entire section for another about eight kilometers to the next albergue. That simple act of generosity and kindness is something that characterizes Camino angels. Another example is this gentleman called Milan from Slovenia. As he was passing another pilgrim on the road, bidding her Gwen Camino, after a few steps, he turned around and saw her crying, sitting on the road, all in desperation, not knowing how to continue. So he comforted her, took her backpack, and carried her all the way to the next albergue. Something that meant a world of difference to her. This is that bench I mentioned. But it's also messages you come across uh, as you're walking the Camino. Like for example, hug your biggest fear, it will turn into love. Or as I was doing Camino Portugues, I took a detour to Fatima. Fatima is not on the Camino de Santiago route. It has its own Camino Fatima route. So after staying at Fatima, I continued on towards Camino de Santiago from Fatima to Tomar, which is about 30, 33 kilometers. And it's a pretty demanding section, particularly in the summer with the heat. 
I was reaching this road after a climb on yet another hill and I was feeling completely worn out. Then I came across this message on the asphalt. Korahem irmao. Have courage, brother. I don't know who wrote that, but those words meant the world to me at that particular moment. It provided such a pick-me-up and gave me such strength to carry on for another six or seven kilometers until I reached Tomar. I remember feeling immense gratitude to whoever wrote this. Now, Camino angels are not necessarily found only on the Camino. This is a trailer for the documentary, I'll Push You. There is a link in the video that you can see, but I suggest if you can find it, Google, I'll Push You. It's a remarkable journey of two friends who did the Camino. Now, two friends are doing the Camino all the time. What makes these two special? Let's hear. I've been fortunate to have uh, a, a good design career where I've worked for some really good design studios. I used to be able to sketch and draw out my ideas and that type of stuff, but then I, I couldn't really do that anymore. I have an autoimmune disease that attacks my nervous system. It was uh, in the in the winter of um, 2010, and up until that point, everything was kind of staying to my waist and below. So I had no weakness in my arms or hands or anything like that. I can tell something's going to happen. I get twitching and cramps in whatever muscles deciding to go next, and so I started getting twitching in my upper right shoulder. By the end of that month, I had significant loss in both my arms. Justin and I um, were friends from the get-go. Even as kids, he could find the silver lining to any cloud. Just always positive, always happy, always driven just to enjoy life. I remember when he told me on the phone that he had started to notice a lot of weakness in his hands. I thought, okay, his, his hands are his lifeblood. This is his career. I wasn't prepared for the first time I saw him after his hands had really started to decline when, uh, when he asked me to help feed him. Having to hold the glass with two hands, needing a straw because he couldn't navigate holding the cup. And then now it's his wife or I or his kids have to hold the cup for him. It was heavy, it was hard to see that, that change. I, I thought over and over, not me, no. Because in a second, I would trade places, in a second. I could see that dark, deep hole that you can go down. And I was on the edge of that. But then, Life is too short to sit around and complain. And life is too short to go down that deep, dark hole.
Well, I wasn't really looking for uh, the Camino. It kind of found me. I was watching PBS and on came Rick Steves and he was doing a thing on Spain. And then he was talking about the Camino. And I was like, what's that? I never heard of it, never heard of it at all. Later, I turned to my wife and I just said, that'd be something that would be crazy to do. I wonder if I could do that in my wheelchair. My immediate thought was, like, Pat and I should do this together. We were sitting in his, his living room, and uh, he asked me, you want to go across the 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And I said, I'll push you. You're going over mountains, you're going through hills and valleys, you're going through the countryside, like miles and miles and miles a day. He's turned it into fuel to do more, to dream big. That's a world changing message. And if we can help encourage others in the process, then, then that would be pretty amazing. So Justin and Patrick did walk the Camino together and I strongly recommend that you check out their website and get the entire documentary for this truly remarkable journey. Now, on their journey, they came across many interesting stories and fascinating experiences in meeting other pilgrims. One of them that struck me particularly was Claudia's story. What is that about? We'll hear here. Claudia is a lady from South Africa who... The loose gravel is just making it rough. So Claudia is a lady from South Africa whose father was murdered as they were counting down the new year waiting for midnight. She was devastated by the experience, so she decided to go to the Camino to try to find some relief from her pain, some attempt at finding meaning. She came across Justin and Patrick and helped them push Patrick, push Justin, sorry, uphill on that steep hill after Castro Caris. She shared her journal entry with Justin and Patrick, which Justin will read now. So you guys hang on, right? Ready, asked Patrick. Yes, ready, we all reply as we flex our muscles and prepare, prepare ourselves for the exertion and exhaustion that lies ahead of us. I'm strapped into a harness at the front next to Jonas, John, who is a 60-year-old recycling specialist slash U.S. Naval officer and regular at the Burning Man Festival in Nevada. We look like a pair of oxen, I say with a smile to him as he wheezes and splutters next to me beads of sweat sliding down his chin and onto the steep gravel path below us. While John and I do the pulling up in the front, Patrick is pushing with a firm grip at the steel bar at the back. He has calves the size of Spanspex after doing this for almost two weeks. Spanspex are cantaloupes, I guess, okay. <laughs> South Africa, okay. Uh, he is flanked by two Swiss girls who we met halfway up this hill. They've started their Camino in Burgos, so they've only been walking for two days and their fresh, unstable blisters are screaming at them with every step they take. Despite the shooting pain, they continue to push onwards and upwards with the rest of us. We're only halfway up this hill and all five of us know that giving up is not an option. You guys are awesome, says Justin as he sits strapply, strapped tightly into his wheelchair as we slowly heave him up the hill. They have a custom-made Camino wheelchair for Justin with off-road wheels and a space for his backpack and various harnesses that can be strapped on to whoever is willing to help up the steep uphills and treacherous downhills. Patrick does most of the pushing, and I have actually started to think of Patrick as an extension of Justin's body. He wipes sweat from his brow, rearranges his legs, and holds ice-cold drink up to his mouth after a long day of trudging through the flat Spanish plains baking in the sun. 
I can't even begin to imagine how difficult it must have been, been for them to climb over the steep, rocky Pyrenees mountain range with its mud slides and loose gravel. When Justin told me about his condition, I said, I'm sorry to hear about that. There's absolutely nothing to be sorry about, he responded. Back on the steep hill. We are finally within 20 meters of the top. The final push, gasped Patrick, while Justin sings a slightly out of tune rendition of That's What Friends Are For. John, the oldest in our group by a good few decades, has tapped out and, we're, and we have replaced him with a passing pilgrim called Matt, who is now in the harness next to me, ready to pull like an ox. Patrick's sweat is cascading down his face and the two Swiss girls next to him look like they're equal parts exhausted and excited. We've been fighting our way up this hill for almost an hour and a half. Ready, asked Patrick. Yes, ready, we all reply, and we're off, inching our way up, a choir of heavy breathing. As we get closer to the top, Justin begins a countdown. 10, nine, eight. No, I think to myself, this can't be happening. The last time I did a countdown, it was followed by unimaginable cruelty. Seven, six, five. Maybe I should ask them to stop. Four, my calves are aching. Three. I'd be happy if I never have to endure another countdown for the rest of my life. Two, I don't know if I can do this, but I'll do it for Justin. One, we get to the top and we're hugging each other, doing a victory dance, celebrating and kissing each other on the cheeks. And I'm crying because I didn't believe that a countdown from 10 could ever be happy again. At the end of the day, we sip our ice cold drinks in the small town of Hontanas. The sun hangs low in the sky and makes me realize that there must be at least a million different shades of gold, and all of them are visible during a maseta at sunset. Justin looks at me and says, thanks for getting me up that hill today. I look back at him and say, no, Justin, it was you who got me up that hill. A truly remarkable story and one of many encounters that they had along the Camino. But the Camino is not about, it's not just about meeting people who help you. It's also meeting somebody who will inspire you with music. As we were walking last year towards Los Arcos, I suddenly heard a tune. Really a memorable moment on the Camino. We're unfortunately at this section, uh, as we are strolling around this uh, sizable ridge, there are no places to sit down, have a cold drink or grab a bite. 
So at least for you virtual walkers, we decided to prepare a virtual Santiago cake, Tarta de Santiago, a delicacy in Galicia, a region where Santiago de Compostela is located. So as we mix all the ingredients, no flour, some eggs, sugar, and almonds, together with some slices of orange or additional flavors, if you want to add. It's basically even a non-talent for cooking, such as myself, is able to scrape it up, mixing it for 15, 20 minutes, putting it inside the mold, put it in the oven for another half an hour, and you got it. And let's see how it turned out. Now it needs to cool off to add some sugar and you print out the Santiago cross, cut it out and create something that you remember from every bakery in Santiago de Compostela. The road continues along the ridge, but this time we are losing the greenery and getting more rocks along the way. This section is called the moon path because it's reminiscent of the surface of the moon. The rocks are everywhere and even on the road, there is a less dirt and more rocks. Almost impossible to get lost, but still the pilgrims are pointing the way. Some truly spectacular nature formed by very strong north wind, which blows alongside the ridge of this hill. But then as we slowly start our descent, we are rewarded with some spectacular view of Bashka, a town which lies in the inlet below. With some marvelous views of the surrounding islands and the coastline. We arrive at Bashka, known as the treasury of Croatian culture. We'll be telling you more about this in a second, as well as a place with some beautiful, beautiful beach. How did we get here? Let's see. So after leaving Verbnik, it didn't take us long. This is that slight uphill that we saw photos from. We are twisting and turning on the Camino Kirk route as we are finding our way uphill. And there we are on top of the ridge. Now it's theoretically possible, but quite difficult to get lost as we follow the road south towards Bashka. Now the ridge to the right, which is awaiting us tomorrow, is definitely much higher than the ones we're walking on right now, even if you don't see it from this 3D rendition. But tomorrow will be a slight challenge, not as difficult as climbing up, for example, Osebreiro, or for example, definitely not as climbing the Pyrenees, 
but still a sizable, a decent steep uphill climb awaits us tomorrow. This is that lunar surface and the moon path which guides us through it. And pretty soon we'll reach that pine forest well, uh, where we promenade following the serpentine path downhill takes us to Bashka. Bashka, and you can see the path winding down. And there we are. Of course, uh, we are not moving 19.8 kilometers per hour. Today's distance is about 19 kilometers overall. So it's not a difficult trek for those who walk the Camino. The next stamp awaits us at Bashka. And let's see more about the place. We're welcomed by the local Dear tourist guys, board I wish director. You all welcome to Bashka. Bashka is located at the very end of the Kirk Island, but only 40 kilometers from the Kirk Bridge. Bashka municipality has four settlements Bashka, Yurandvor, Batomal, and Draga Bashanska. Bashka is nowadays a very popular summer tourist destination. Behind me, you can see Vela Plaza, the beach two kilometers long, that attracts many guests coming each year to Bashka from all parts of Europe. On the other side, you can see the island of Prvić, the largest uninhabited island in Croatia, that is also well known as a botanical and ornithological reserve. But Bashka is nowadays also very popular destination for active holidays. In Bashka, you can find 19 marked trails for hiking and walking, but also mountain bike routes and an educational route from Bashka to Darok, Batomal, and Podlipicu. Spectacular settings and nature is not all. Bashka has many other attractions to offer, and there is a reason why it is known as one of the most important places of the Croatian culture. Because at Bashka, at the nearby church of St. Lucia, a Bashka tablet was found. One of the earliest known inscriptions, discovered inscriptions in the Croatian language using an alphabet called Glagolithic. One example you can see on this stone monument. Alphabet developed by two monks from Greece who were sent by the Byzantine emperor to spread the gospels among the Slavic settlers who inhabited the Balkans in the seventh century. Some stunning views. And we'll see more about it in the next part where we can see more about and learn more about the Glagolithic alphabet and a unique trail. Bashka is also an important cultural destination since in Bashka the Bashka tablet was found. Bashka tablet is the most important monument of early Croatian literacy. Thanks to Bashka tablet, the Glagolithic script has become a trademark of Bashka and an inspiration for Glagolitic Trail. The Glagolitic letter L sculpture is located at the entrance to Urandvor. The L sculpture is almost four and a half meters high and two tons in weight. It is made of three stone blocks 
made by technique stone to stone, an ancient dry stone wall construction technique without using connection material. The church of Santa Lucia is truly spectacular. It is not only important for its cultural value, but also as you'll see from these images of the interior, when you enter inside, the church itself was built as a sort of a sun clock where the light shines, sunlight shines at the altar at certain specific hours of the day when mass is being celebrated. You can see more in the photos here. So even without any artificial light, this is a place where you truly feel a connection to the divine. This is the replica of the Bashka tablet, uh, which is still present at Santa Lucia, though the original is at the museum in Zagreb. And these are examples of actual e credencial with the Camino Kirk stamps taken on the Camino route. As yesterday, a spiritual reflection awaits us at the end of our virtual walk. So we'll join again Father Dominic for a few words. Jedeča Neki zbog toga odustaju od hodočašća i traže neka nova hodočasnička mjesta gdje nema toliko ljudi. Takvim činima ljudi griješe jer i u najvećoj gužvi moguće je stvoriti osamu. I u ljudima krcato javeni moguće je ući u pokrajnju ulicu i već je manje ljudi. Pusto mjesto bez buke mogu postati naše misli i naše srce. No zato treba rasti u našoj duhovnosti, tražiti trenutke osame, trenutke sabranosti i molitve. Kakva li je tvoja duhovnost? Rasteš li u svojoj duhovnosti? Roniš li u dubine ili si u pličaku svoje vjere? Nalaziš li u jednom danu trenutak za osobnu osamu? That concludes our journey for today. Thank you so much for being with us on this virtual Camino walk. Your pilgrim passport for today uh, will await you, or the registration link for your pilgrim passport for today will await you in the comment section of the YouTube link or the Facebook video that you've been using to watch this program. Thank you so much, and please join us tomorrow for the final uh, day on the virtual Camino Kirk route, where we enter the Church of St. James at Cornish, but we also pass some more magnificent scenery, some ancient shrines, and learn more about the Camino experiences along the way. Good night and buen Camino.